All right, team, we're back at it. So today we'll, we will be talking about operations management issues as they relate to sport management. For the purpose of this presentation, what we are really going to be looking at is the concept known as premise liability and the unique legal issues that they create for sport managers from an operational standpoint. So as part of this, we need to understand uh, the concept of duty, because duty plays a key role in premise liability analyses. Duty is one aspect of the negligence analysis. We had previously talked about negligence, and as a refresher, for, uh, for, for if you if it's not uh, clicking in your head right now, negligence is conduct that falls below a certain standard of care that's been established by society, and because of that breach, the law will enforce some sort of remedy. So the creation of duty can occur in certain circumstances. It's created either for the purposes of this unit by the creation of a relationship. It could be that someone has paid money to a facility owner and that paying of money allows that person certain benefits or privileges, and one of those benefits or privileges is protection from foreseeable and unreasonable risks of harm. Or that creation of duty could be uh, done so through the creation of a special relationship, such as a coach and a player, or a, uh, an adult and a child, or, or perhaps a lifeguard and a client. It could also be that someone voluntarily assumes that duty of care by helping out uh, in a rescue if someone is drowning, a good Samaritan. And if that, if a good Samaritan law is not in the books, then there could be a potential potential liability for that person uh, for breaching a standard of care that has been established by their voluntary acts. And then finally, statutory uh, duty of care can be creative, and that's just the legislature passing laws that again create some sort of uh, affirmative duty of care. It could be a doctor to a patient. It could be trainers to uh, their their uh, client. It's just a matter of what the legislature puts on the books. So once that standard of care has been created, then we need to look at the scope of that stand of that duty of care. Um, and that really is to look, is to uh, conduct themselves as a reasonable and prudent person and to protect a uh, the other side, whether it's a ticket holder or if it's the client from uh, being subjected from uh, subjected to foreseeable and unreasonable risks of harm. And once that happens, then there's a, a, a standard of care that both party that the party needs to conduct themselves under, and they could breach that standard of care by not comporting with that duty. And if there is a direct connection, between the breach of the duty of care and the injury, then there could be negligence proven. So for example here, let's take a quick look at this video uh, involving hot dog launchers and them being used in major league uh, baseball parks. And it's a goofball in the green suit. Yeah, oh, n not just anybody can operate the launcher. The fanatic makes it look easy because he's a highly trained professional. You're shooting a, you know, a hot dog projectile, so to speak, you know, a couple hundred, 200 feet up into the seats. The one thing that always entices me about um, is that is how high they go. Shooting projectiles into the stand. Every now and then, for whatever reason, they don't get the, the packages wrapped tightly enough or there's a malfunction of some kind. Malfunction. It, it just go south in a hurry, if you know what I mean. Usually, you know, the birds and things will clean it up for us if we don't get all the little pieces. You got to make sure you're paying attention, though, because you want to get one of those things right between the eyes. We get uh, yeah. fans calling into Hatfield all the time, asking about the launcher and asking about when the launcher is going to be used. So think about that, just from that short video. And this kind of uh, concept of bringing a hot dog launcher to a Major League Baseball game uh, falls under sort of promotions and legal issues within marketing promo and promotions. Uh, which this can, class has a bit of a connection with. But think about sort of the duty of care that a major league uh, franchise is under in terms of how are they going to protect 
the people who come to those games from being subject to foreseeable and unreasonable risks of harm. The people uh, in that video who were representatives of the Philadelphia Phillies were talking about, well, if you're not paying attention, you could get one of those between the eyes. They can travel 200, up 200 feet in the stands. Malfunctions can happen. You can get the, the foil going one way if they're in the hot dog going another way. If it's not properly wrapped. And think about sort of the dangers that that high velocity sort of um, projectile might have if someone is struck uh, in the stands. So in terms of the duty of care that's owed by a facility owner or operator or someone who's leasing that uh, to whoever is coming onto that onto the grounds is really a function of their designation. But at the end of the day, the baseline duty of care for these, um, these facilities is to protect the customer from um, foreseeable risks of harm. And that is their duty of reasonable care. But really, what is foreseeable? Well, if you think back to uh, the prior lecture, that notion of what is foreseeable falls under what a reasonable person would recognize. And this is a mythical person, but sort of this general barometer of what society believes is reasonable. And then what they would recognize as involving a, a risk of harm from one person to another, and that the risk actually outweighs the utility of the act. So again, going back to the hot dog gun, well, what's sort of the benefit of, of shooting hot dogs wrapped in, in foil at high velocity? What is the benefit and what is the risk? And then the duty of care that's owed to the people uh, that might be subject to that risk of harm is based on their designation. And there's these basic, there's these different designations here. Uh, and these designations impact the legal responsibilities that facility owners or operators have. But the scope of the duty is based on the status of someone either being an invitee, whether they're a business invitee or a public invitee, which we'll talk about, a trespasser or a licensee. And then also defenses are available to each uh, to the facility owners, operators uh, based on these designations. But what someone is classified as impacts what the um, what the duty of care is. So the first status is an invitee, and the baseline duty that a facility has to someone who is characterized as an invitee is that the facility must provide a reasonable uh, re reasonable care to the. Uh, person coming onto the facility, they are invited. And because they're invited, it's good public policy to give them ma ma uh, maximum protection. The test, generally speaking, for whether or not someone is an invitee is asking the question of whether or not an economic benefit is being provided by the person coming onto the property to the uh, landowner or the operator. So, for example, a fan who pays a ticket to attend an event is usually designated as an invitee so long as the facility derives a financial benefit from that person coming to that stadium. And that benefit is going to be paying money. So once that occurs, once that is established, you've got the transaction of money being given to the facility for the right of that individual to enter the premise, then these specific duties of reasonable care apply. So uh, the duty to design the, the facility in a safe manner, duty to warn of hidden dangers, duty to inspect, the duty to repair um, damages in the facility, and the duty to uh, render uh, reasonable medical uh, assistance. And we'll, we'll jump back to that. Same thing goes for the public invitee. This is someone who is on public land and they were uh, on it legally. So using parks or, facil or facilities that are on a public land, um, again, there it's good public policy to provide them maximum protection. And therefore, um, they uh, that duty of reasonable care is important. So um, for example, when you attend a community event at your local park, uh, and it's a public venue, then you are a public invitee. 
So here is an example of someone who is a business invitee who potentially has a cause of action due to the facility not providing the maximum uh, care, is, is providing reasonable care. So you've got um, a person who's paid for the ticket to go to a Miami Heat game. And during a, um, a downtime, during a timeout, the mascot goes into the stands and physically brings a patron to the center court to participate in some sort of antics or some sort of contest. But that patron wants to return to her seat, so she tries to leave. But the mascot forcibly put, pulls her back to the center court, and the individual, uh, she ends up breaking her purse strap, falling, and then injuring herself. And as a result of that, the, uh, the person who was harmed sues the Miami Heat for uh, physical and mental damages, being humiliated and suffering medical injury. And because of that, she reaches a settlement with the Miami Heat for $50,000. So again, where is the duty created? Well, this patron paid a certain amount of money for a ticket to gain access to the Miami Heat game. And because that economic benefit was given to the Heat organization, she was owed a duty of care uh, where the Heat needed to provide reasonable care to her, which was prevent her from being subjected to foreseeable or unreasonable risks of harm. Well, it's foreseeable that if someone doesn't want to go on the center court and is struggling to get away, that she might uh, somehow hurt herself in the process uh, during the commotion. It is, for, it is not completely unforeseeable. So if someone is not an invitee, then they very well might be a licensee. And a licensee is someone who's authorized to be on the premise, but and therefore they um, enter the facility or the building or the property with the consent of the property owner or manager, but they're not giving any sort of financial benefit. So it's not a business invitation. Uh, so this here, if there's no financial benefit transfer, uh, transferred from the the person seeking to enter and the facility, then um, it would be someone that's such as a, a guest who's not paying money to go watch a game. Maybe it's a uh, family member wanting to watch uh, their uh, their cousin or their uh, daughter participate in a game, or it could be a tour, or it could be the media or volunteers accessing the property. And in this situation, um, the duty of care is limited um, to a, a lesser threshold where the facility only needs to protect that individual from known dangers. So while the invitee is owed the maximum protection where the facility needs to continuously inspect the facility and guard against any potential dangers, here a licensee only needs to protect um, the uh, inv or the, the licensee from known dangers. So there's a much lower threshold. Next is the trespasser. So here, a trespasser, we know based on movies and television shows, it's someone who comes onto the property without permission. And although there's little duty of care, um, the owner still has the duty of care to not make the premise less safe. So um, although some states might say, and this might vary from state to state by statute, that there is no duty of care, um, the predominant uh, legal reasoning is that you cannot make the, the property uh, more unsafe for someone. So um, there was uh, often, uh, back in the day, back in the early 1900s, um, farmers would set up in their barns, they would set up these spring action shotguns that if a trespasser or someone who didn't know any better opened up the barn door, it would actually end up causing the, the, the firearm to fire. And that could sometimes be fatal to the, um, to the, uh, the trespasser or the thief. So in that situation, if there, if there is a duty of care not to make the facility less safe, then that actually, the act of putting that firearm there uh, or any sort of booby trap actually would create potential liability. The only example, or the only exception here, is for what's called attract, attractive nuisance. Um, 
And the attractive nuisance doctrine is for situations where a landowner has a condition on their property that may attract children or someone who cannot appreciate the dangers associated with that condition on the property. So oftentimes um, children are uh, attracted to pools that are left unattended. Either it's filled with water or it's not filled with water and it's hollowed out or construction sites that are not adequately fenced in or abandoned train, uh, train cars. All these situations uh, might attract uh, young people who aren't able to appreciate the danger of uh, accessing these sites without adult supervision or at all. And in these situations, um, the law of exercising reasonable, ca reasonable care is in place. So in these situations, the uh, this landowner or land operator needs to act reasonably, which usually means fencing in the facility so that people cannot access it uh, absent climbing over uh, a 10 to 12 foot fence. So this would create a, 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 a normal duty of care, even if it's a trespasser. Now, some defenses to uh, premise liability are, are pretty varied. Um, two prevailing uh, defenses uh, that are often used in premise liability cases uh, involving sport or recreation are the uh, open and obvious uh, defense and the uh, recreational use defense. So the open and obvious doctrine basically says that if someone, uh, someone who is the operator or owner of a property is not going to be li uh, liable for an invitee who injures themselves uh, when they choose to encounter an open and obvious danger. Um, so, for example, in the Con versus uh, Havistrock Havis case, you had uh, a golfer who often goes and plays this course, and they uh, he chose to drive his cart, uh, golf cart up a steep path. And even though he uh, he was familiar with uh, the, the sort of the dangerous condition of this severe slope, uh, he still did it. He went down a, the, the path and hit and lost control and hit a tree, injuring himself. Um, the plaintiff sued, but the defendant actually said that uh, the plaintiff should have known about the danger based off of his knowledge of the top topography of the course. And the court actually agreed with this. So this is a situation where there is a condition that is a dangerous condition that's open and obvious and that the uh, the, the plaintiff or the, someone en encountering the, the property chooses to, even though they appreciate and recognize the risk, they still choose to actually uh, go ahead and, and, and move forward with it um, and, and try to encounter the risk. Now, um, <clears throat> recreational use doctrine or rec recreational use statutes um, are laws that are on the books where a statute will provide immunity to a landowner, uh, even though it's private property and not public property, but it's in certain situations, a landowner can be immune from liability. Um, and these statutes are designed to encourage people with large open spaces of unimproved land, meaning there's no sort of buildings or anything on them, to allow the general public to use it for recreation purposes free of charge. And this is, again, a public policy rationale so that uh, people... Uh, have safe spaces, uh, large places to, to plan to supplement parks. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of um, um, strategies to use as a sport manager, well, remember that the invitees uh, when when a uh, facility owner is dealing with invitees, that is a very high threshold and the duty to inspect the premise uh, continuously uh, is in, is a, an important duty of care. So as part of living up to this duty of care, the facility owner needs or operator needs to develop an inspection protocol such as a checklist to continuously monitor what conditions are um, new uh, within your property that could create a risk of harm. So that also uh, helps with uh, the duty to inspect, but in addition to creating a checklist, uh, you need to make sure that your inspectors are properly trained and that 
inspections are occurring fairly regularly so that you can show uh, as an entity that you are abiding by your duty of care. And then once dangerous conditions are revealed through your inspection, um, sport managers should make sure that uh, these dangerous conditions are repaired or remedied promptly. So a system should be developed for reporting these conditions. And while uh, these uh, conditions do exist in a, um, it's the, the um, system is notifying the, the correct people uh, that need, that will remedy the dangerous condition, um, the facility should put up warning signs there in plain view and, and, and legible. So of course we've seen um, what, oftentimes when there's a spill on the floor or if, it's a, uh, if there's a dangerous condition that uh, exists out there, there'll be caution signs, uh, danger or a wet floor, and it'll be clearly marked off. So that system should also include these prompt reporting and notice provisions because um, the law uh, of premise liability will often say that when you are dealing with business invitees, um, an excuse by the defendant that they did not know about the danger uh, will not cut it because if uh, if you are um, if you as the land uh, operator or owner actually were engaging in in um, in reasonable uh, if you were abiding by your um, your standard of care, then you would have actually achieved notice. You would have uh, discovered this this danger. So um, this is why, again, um, consistent uh, inspections and actually um, re repairing these conditions promptly are important. Then finally, the duty to provide uh, medical assistance. So um, again, for those who uh, are on more of the training, athletic trainer side or medical side, um, you need to provide the, the type of care that you hold yourself out as uh, based on your based on the qualifications um, uh, that your credentials that you're trying to hold yourself out uh, as having. And oftentimes knowing uh, what the AED uh, automatic electronic defibrillator requirements are for your state are also important. So I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Since we're talking about premise liability and oftentimes support managers uh, work in facilities where um, projectiles go into the stands, understanding uh, how to limit an organization's liability for these projectiles is important. And here we've got the limited duty rule, uh, issues involving protecting spectators, and, the, and then the exceptions to these, uh, to these uh, different uh, doctrines. So with spectator injuries, oftentimes because we're dealing with sports where you have to buy a ticket to, in order to enter, um, the spectators who are being injured uh, in, your, in your facility are, um, are invitees. So uh, an owner does have the duty of reasonable care uh, to maintain the safety of those spectators. And we see this oftentimes in crowd control issues or injuries from uh, alcohol consumption or injuries from projectiles going into the stands. So because this happens very, very often, uh, projectiles going into the stands, um, a body of law, judgment law, known as the limited duty rule has developed. And the limited duty rule was created as a way to balance, uh, accommodate the balance between spectators wanting an unobstructed view of the action for a game, but also facilities operators' duty of care to protect them. So the limited duty rule was originally created that says um, a facility owner or operator will escape liability if they provide uh, an opportunity for spectators to purchase tickets in an area that's protected by netting and then also uh, have a, an opportunity for them to, to buy tickets in other areas. And then within those most dangerous sections of the stands, the operator or owner needs to make sure that there is uh, protection, whether it's netting or other forms. Screen seats behind home plate or a hockey goal are great examples. Um, and if a facility 
meets these uh, this burden, these two things, then they potentially could avoid liability. But some um, some states are fighting back here. Some state legislatures have taken the steps of overruling this judge-made law uh, through the limited duty rule by saying that um, if the the only way that liability can occur is if the pr protective netting is defective. So this kind of, uh, here is an example here um, in terms of um, in terms of the limited duty rule. We see here, um, based on the statute, um, if the netting is defective, like uh, at this baseball park, um, then there would create a, um, a cause of action to, to sue. So as I said, the limited duty rule is uh, a creature of, of, of uh, judicial law, stare decisis, case law. And each state has its own body of, uh, of case law involving the limited duty rule. So, for example, in our textbook, it talked about the South Shore baseball versus De Jesus. And it said that the facility owner is not liable for injuries to spectators that result from projectiles leaving the field uh, of play if it's safe, if safety screening has been provided. And that really is uh, going along the lines of the prevailing, um, the prevailing laws or the prevailing decisions. Um, but although that's the the um, the, the majority of the states, there is a minority of the states that actually takes the opposite approach. And in Roundtree versus Boise Baseball, uh, back in 2013, uh, a court ruled against the Boise Baseball LLC, uh, which is the, on the owner of the minor league baseball team where this injury occurred, because this person was struck not in a high traffic area, but elsewhere in the stadium. And therefore, since this was a case of first impression, the court chose not to uh, enforce the limited duty rule and did allow the plaintiff to move forward with their lawsuit. An additional um, doctrine that comes into play when we're talking about issues involving projectiles in the stands is um, this distraction doctrine. So traditionally, according, uh, according to the limited duty rule, um, a facility owner or operator will not be liable if, again, if this, there's screening in the facility and if the most high traffic areas in terms of projectiles are, are provided with pro, uh, protective netting and then um, patrons are given the opportunity to buy tickets in the screened area uh, as well as the non-screened area. Well, in this case, um, with the distraction doctrine, um, the court chose to allow a lawsuit to move forward even though um, the netting was in place because the plaintiff was being distracted by a uh, mascot that was uh, causing the um, causing the patron to not pay attention to the game. He was being, uh, I believe was the, the, the mascot's tail kept on bumping in to the patron, which caused him to turn around and see what was going on. And then he was hit by... Um, hit by a follow ball. So compare what happened in the um, in this low versus California league case with the hot dog can cannon because the court in that in, in this low case said we are only going to apply the limited limited duty rule to elements of, of the baseball game that are that are necessary in order for um, the baseball game to, to play. Um, in other words, um, the plaintiff only assumes the risk of the inherent aspects of the game of baseball, and the defendants do not owe any duty to the plaintiff um, to be to protect be protected from those inherent aspects of the game. But the court correctly um, concluded that mascots are not a necessary indispensable element of of a baseball game, and instead it was something that uh, creates. Um, uh, that it is something that is not inherent, and therefore the plant does not assume those risks. So think about um, the hot dog cannon. Is the hot dog cannon uh, projectile uh, a inherent risk of the game of baseball? And I think I know that what what um, conclusion everyone would come to. So again, uh, it's important uh, to understand 
what type of client you have from a facilities perspective, um, whether or not they are an invitee or a licensee or trespasser, because if it is an invitee, then you owe all of these uh, pretty uh, important duties of care. And they are can be very comprehensive and expensive in terms of how you meet that burden. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, make sure that uh, when you do get, get into organizations, to have policies and procedures in place so that you can meet each of these duties. So um, it's also important uh, in terms of the inspection to know that um, a court will hold an organization liable if they, even if they fail to uh, gain notice of a risk because they should have, if they would have engaged in a, a diligent uh, inspection that they would have uncovered that risk. So that's actually the uh, actual notice versus constructive notice. Actual notice is, is as an organization actually finding out about this risk and then constructive notice is that by your lack of um, inspection, even though a reasonably prudent organization would have inspected, uh, you are now deemed that to be aware of that risk. So a, a few more slides here, um, spectator injury issues. Um, in addition to um, projectiles, we also have the danger of crowd control. So a facility owner or operator must um, provide a reasonable uh, duty of care and to their um, to their patrons. And this is for things that they have actual knowledge, as well as dangers that they would uh, provide uh, would have achieved constructive knowledge due to its foreseeability. So for example here, uh, in addition to dangerous uh, uh, risks that occur in stands such as fighting, um, a facility may also be liable for injuries that happen outside the stadium in parking lots and thoroughways that are owned by the facility. In the um, Behrman versus Notre Dame case, we had a situation where um, uh, a woman was injured um, when she was put, she um, was fallen into uh, by two people who were fighting, and they were fighting. Um, and the that that um, that parking lot was not well lit, and there was no security personnel to actually break up the fight. And therefore, because there wasn't any um, security personnel um, there. Notre Dame breached their duty of care because they gained constructive knowledge of that risk of harm because it would have been foreseeable that things like fights would occur if no one was there to break them up uh, when you're dealing with el uh, alcohol and, and, and testosterone, etc. So um, it's important for uh, organizations to not only have uh, adequate security and have adequate lighting and make sure that it's abiding by its duty of care for what it has actual knowledge of. Because Notre Dame said we didn't know that this was that this fight was going on, but the court said, well, if you would have had security there, you would have known. Therefore, you went from you had constructive knowledge of that risk. So um, it's important for organizations to have zero to uh, tolerance policies for bad behavior by fans, which might include creating codes of conduct and having adequate uh, police and representatives to enforce them. Um, do you guys, I, I would be curious to know um, what you think about codes of conduct and whether or not they work. So some competitive strategies uh, in terms of crowd control. So again, um, kind of similar to uh, risk management um, and, um, and uh, preventive law and then abiding by your duty of care. It's important to have these control plans uh, uh, for a facility should put together a control plan uh, that's based on factors that are unique to your uh, sport or to your contest and make sure that um, you are able to uh, uh, put forth um, predictions based on information to show what behavior by your patrons are foreseeable. And then also, um, it might also be helpful to help with that code of conduct by having uh, adults uh, or parents uh, um, of children participating in youth, youth sports 
to only cheer positively and show good sportsmanship uh, during uh, youth youth games. Um, we also, uh, in terms of crowd issues, it's increasingly more common to have injuries due to alcohol consumption. So uh, tailgating and, and alcohol consumption um, related to sporting events has really become big business. And as tailgating with food and alcohol has become more elaborate, the risks of harm have become more and more foreseeable. And it's important uh, because it's important for facilities to have proper uh, planning to prevent foreseeable risks of harm from happening because prior incidents are becoming more commonplace or incidents are becoming more commonplace at different venues and these the note the occurrence of these incidents uh, at other facilities creates sort of a, a prior notice a constructive notice to the to other facilities that these risks are uh, possible and therefore they should be uh, that they that facility should create policies to protect um, business invitees from these foreseeable risks of harm. Um, sometimes uh, issues occur involving dram shops uh, or in, in terms of selling uh, uh, alcohol to minors who are or those who are uh, visibly intoxicated, so over serving people. So dram shop acts impose liability on the organization for uh, these actions. So this is also very important. So some competitive strategies for, um, for these situations uh, uh, involve um, developing alcohol management uh, policies regarding um, tailgating and serving alcohol and making sure that you enforce these policies in a fair and consistent man manner. Also, education is very important so that you can get with your different partners and, and constituents to uh, work to educate different groups on what uh, what is responsible drinking, and then perhaps incentivize individuals to be designated drivers and to curb uh, dangerous activity involving alcoholism, uh, among other strategies. So these are just a few of the issues uh, relating to operations uh, issues within sport management. So hopefully this was a helpful uh, presentation. And as always, I welcome your feedback and let's take the discussion online and, and, and uh, hopefully continue to uh, learn a great deal about uh, this area of sport management. Thank you.